Toronto is a city that's rapidly approaching three million people. But we're also the centre of a larger, greater Toronto region that's maybe twice that size. We have a city that was built for a certain amount of rainfall, uh, a certain temperature range, and unfortunately that's not the amount of rainfall and temperature range we're going to have in the future. So all of our infrastructure is built for the wrong climate. We took a report to council where we, we looked at the impact of climate change on Toronto's weather. And the results of that study indicated that we should expect to see hotter hots, more heat waves, um, and more significant storms. That was in 2012. In 2013, we had two of those significant storms. We had a huge storm burst where we had about 126 millimeters of rain in under two hours. The Don River was flooded. Um, the GO train, one of the main rail systems in and out of the city, flooded in the Don River. It caused over a billion dollars in damage. Six months later, we had an ice storm that uh, uh, destroyed uh, the electricity system in the eastern part of the city in Scarborough, and it took weeks for the power to come on. That collectively, those two events cost the city and taxpayers and you know, insurance companies, etc., well over $1.3 billion. Climate change is happening right now and it's having a negative impact on people. There were some other impacts. Last year, Lake Ontario was a meter above normal levels. That's a lot. The island, which is a major source of recreation for people in Toronto and visitors to the city, was basically closed until July. So the businesses on the island really suffered. Um, some of them actually closed down at the end of the season last year. Pretty much every service we provide, uh, our, our transportation network, our public health system, even our policing and emergency services, have to change how they think about the service they deliver because we're going to be living in a different world than the one we live in now. We tend to look at the impact of storms on infrastructure, hard things. You know, are there wires down, are there transformer vaults flooded, this sort of thing. But the great learning was at the end of the wires, at the end of the pipes, there are people, residents of the city, who are dependent on the services that those utilities provide. And the impact on people when those services are not available is huge. As we do our resilience work, as we move forward with this file, the human impact of climate change is really front and center. There's a lot that we can do to make the city both climate resilient and, and help contribute to preventing the worst impacts of, of climate change. Instead of directing all the water into pipes and tunnels under the, under the city, we're now adopting a strategy of trying to prevent it from running off. We have a green development standard and for new buildings we ask developers can you come up with a system that manages the stormwater on your property? Green roofs, retention tanks under the building, anything to stop it from rushing into our system and out into the lake. One of the innovative measures that was implemented in 2009 was deep lake water cooling. So basically there are pipes out into Lake Ontario that bring cold water up into the city and that cold water is circulated around to buildings in the core for air conditioning. So there's I believe about 60-65 buildings that are connected to the deep lake water cooling system. All of them are displacing electricity for you know, the traditional mechanical air conditioning systems. We've gone through many iterations of thinking about climate change at the city because we keep learning new things and other cities keep innovating and creating and we go and cherry pick the best ideas. Our latest iteration is something called Transform TO. It's a plan that many thousands of people in Toronto help to design. We have a, an initiative called Transform TO, which is our strategy to get to um, Council's directive, which was a, an 80% reduction of our gas emissions uh, by 2050 relative to 1990. We're looking to move towards fuel sources that are not carbon contributors over that 50-year period. We have the technologies available today to allow us to achieve our goal. 
What's wonderful about the plan is that this is probably the first plan in, in Toronto's history that says when we're doing things to reduce carbon, we want to make sure those actions are not just reducing carbon emissions, they're also creating community benefits. For example, doing proper retrofits of Toronto community housing so that people who are living in that housing, their environmental conditions improve as well as, you know, the emissions profile of the buildings. Linked to that, what can we do about, you know, skilling up a workforce um, to do home retrofits? We know that this is going to need to be done on a massive scale in Toronto. So many of our emissions come from our buildings looking at how to use climate change to actually make our society better. The neighborhoods of the future mean that your job, your school, your entertainment, your social spaces and your home are compactly and in an integrated way all part of the neighborhood you live in so that you don't travel as much. We want to get our communities here really transforming whole ways of life. And that's everything from individual actions to civic engagement. And that's the opportunity that's before us. That's how you have a cultural transformation. And for me, that's my North Star. That's what I'm shooting for. I hope and I believe that humanity and people in Toronto and across Canada will realize there is there are a million benefits for doing the right thing and those far outweigh any of the negative stuff that we hear from the special interests that want the status quo to continue. This is the issue of our time. We will be measured by future generations on how we deal with this. There's been a, a dramatic adoption of the cause by subnational governments. The cities are the ones that are saying this is real. We're the ones that are impacted by this and this is where the leadership has to be. One of the key drivers to take action against climate change is within the communities that we all live in and work in and represent.